Peter Tatchell. There's a film about you out recently called Hating Peter Tatchell. What is it about your story, your career, that you think made a good film? Well, the film came about because the director, Christopher Amos, when he was doing the research, was astonished to discover the level of hate and vitriol against me. Mostly, of course, by supporters of various tyrants and bigots that I've challenged over the years. Uh, so that's how the name came about. It was basically Chris's work. You know, I, he had total editorial independence. Uh, my only real involvement was going to Moscow um, when Chris shadowed me uh, when I attempted and did stage a, a protest for LGBT plus rights on the opening day of the World Cup in 2018. Um, you know, particularly against the persecution of LGBT plus people in Chechnya. But for me, the motivation for the film was very much about um, showing how to be a change maker. You know, through my experience and my actions, hopefully inspiring other people that they too can make social change. Did you have any reservations in having a film about your life made or was everything pretty much already out there in the open and this is just a continuation of a career that has been about role modelling change and um, serving as a figure for others to inspire action? Well, I feel very humbled to have a film made about me in the first place, uh, given there are so many other great social activists. Um, but I think what you know, was a real challenge in making this film for the director was how to whittle down you know, over 3,000 campaigns that I've done uh, since the late 1960s, more than half a century, uh, to whittle it down to about a dozen or so key campaigns. So obviously things like the attempted arrest of President Mugabe of Zimbabwe on charges of torture, uh, the interruption of the Archbishop of Canterbury's um, Easter sermon in 1998, over church homophobia and so on. The film, there was some criticism of the film for um, mainly representing um, experiences of white, male, gay experience at the expense of maybe other intersectional voices. Do you think those um, critics had any point or do you think this was about your story? Well, inevitably, if it's a film about me, it's going to be looking at my involvement in various campaigns, but I think you've got a very strong flavour during the film that I was one of many involved in a campaign. So going back to the late 1960s, um, my involvement uh, in the campaign against uh, the Vietnam War and for the rights of indigenous black Australians was very much in collaboration with others. So it wasn't either an exclusively LGBT plus campaign, um, nor was it you know, a, um, a series of campaigns that, that took a one-sided view about simply white or British or European issues. The LGBT plus movement in recent years has been seen maybe to be a bit more divided. Do you think that's uh, a, an accurate reflection of what's actually happening or has there always been divisions and that's just something that's come more into light recently? Well, there certainly are divisions and always have been divisions in every social movement. Uh, what concerns me is when those divisions become sectarian, when they become abusive, um, when they're more focused on fighting each other rather than fighting the main enemy. And, you know, we have to, you know, battle against the huge prejudice faced by LGBT plus people, um, less so now in Britain than before, but it's still there. You know, the huge spike in homophobic, biphobic and transphobic hate crimes is very worrying. But more particularly, the global struggle you know, of LGBT plus people around the world. And I think that internationalism is so fundamental that we cannot remain content while any queer person anywhere in the world is being oppressed and disadvantaged. And so for me, even right back to the late 1960s, whereas others are very much focusing on you know, the situation here in Britain, I always had an internationalist perspective. You know, this was a global fight. So I remember in 1971 organising a campaign against Cuba's um, roundup and incarceration in labour camps of LGBT plus people, uh, which was very controversial because I was on the left, um, but I don't brook, you know, neither left-wing nor right-wing homophobia. 
you were selected as a candidate for Labour in Bermondsey in the early 80s. Um, do you ever think about how things might have panned out differently if you'd become a Member of Parliament and been on the Labour benches? Well, of course, if I had been elected, I probably would have ended up uh, on the back benches like Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> and look where he ended up. Um, you know, it's who, who can tell? The one thing I would say is that um, maybe in some respects it was better that I wasn't elected, although I would have liked to have taken my human rights campaigns into Parliament, but maybe being on the outside has given me greater freedom. You know, I've been able to do things, and sometimes in quite provocative and confrontational ways where necessary, which wouldn't be so easy for a Member of Parliament. But a Member of Parliament can uh, work to pass legislation that changes what's happening in that country at that time. Do you think being outside the system meant you had less impact and were more of a figurehead? Well, of course, changing the law is only one aspect. You know, we also have to change the way in which institutions operate and change public hearts and minds. And I think I've probably done the latter two more effectively from the outside. But of course, I've also you know, had some impact on legislation. So the Equality Act of 2010, that was an idea that I and a handful of other people had way back in the late 1970s. We were arguing for a comprehensive equality law to protect everyone against discrimination. And it took, you know, over 40 or over, over 30 years to make that law. Um, and I think, you know, I played a very small part in bring that about. So even from outside Parliament, as with any social movement, um, I helped influence what happened in Parliament and legislation that was eventually passed. What do you think the Peter Tatchell who moved to London in the early 1970s would make of the state of gay liberation and women's liberation in 2021 in the UK and internationally at the moment? Well, I can remember in 1969, at the age of 17, when I first came out, when I first realised I was gay and came out, um, in my hometown of Melbourne, Australia, there was no LGBT plus movement, not even any council organisations or switchboards, absolutely nothing. So the only reference I had was looking at the black civil rights movement in the United States. And I can remember thinking in my mind as a rather <laughs> ill-educated 17-year-old, uh, if black people are an oppressed minority who deserve equal rights, then the same applies to LGBT plus people. And that was, <laughs> you know, looking back, that was, that was quite an early conception because the idea of gay people as an oppressed minority deserving equal rights was, I'd never heard it before. And, you know, it only really began to evolve later on in the 1970s. Um, I also remember again based on studying the black civil rights movement, calculating that it would probably take about 50 years to win LGBT plus equality in Western countries like Australia, Britain and the United States. Uh, that was a speculative guesstimate, but it's, it's more or less turned out to be right. So, you know, um, chance and, you know, good luck, I guess. What does the work that you do and that your foundation does um focus on in the next 10, 15, 20 years? Well, I've always championed unpopular causes. <laughs> um, choosing causes that others are not focusing on or that perhaps don't have the same level of, you know, public support or understanding. So, you know, internationally, I've done a lot of work um, supporting the oppressed Arab minority in Iran, the Awazi Arabs who were annexed by Iran in the 1920s and have been under occupation ever since. Uh, likewise, the people of Balochistan, who were annexed by Pakistan in 1948, and the people of West Papua, who were an annexed by Indonesia in the 1960s. Um, these are national liberation struggles that are pretty much below the radar. There's almost no one else on the left who is championing those causes. So that's why I choose to focus on them, because very few other voices are supporting them. Um, here in Britain, one of my great you know, issues, or a number of great issues, include you know, voting reform. 
You know, it's absolutely outrageous that here in Britain, no political party has won a majority of the public vote since 1931. Every single government has been a minority one, including, of course, Boris Johnson's election victory in 2019. He won less than 44% of the vote, yet the Tories ended up with 56% of the seats and an 80-seat majority. That is not democracy. You know, the majority of people did not want the Tories. The Conservatives have no mandate for anything. And, you know, the same applies to Labour. You know, back in the Tony Blair days, Blair won on a minority of the vote, including his great landslide of seats in 1997, which was based on about 43% of the vote. Um, so that's an issue that's very close to my heart. And it's becoming more popular, but when I began campaigning for it back in the 1980s, uh, there was almost nobody on the left who would support it. Um, Labour was, and to some extent still is, very tribalist. The idea of, you know, not being able to secure a majority, um, which of course PR means, you know, PR means you can only get a majority of seats if you get a majority of votes. Um, you know, a lot of Labour people are still very resistant to that. Another issue I've championed is economic democracy. Um, you know, we all expect political democracy, but which virtually no one is campaigning for economic democracy. You know, we live in Britain in an economic dictatorship where all the votes are held by major shareholders, investment companies, directors and managers. The ordinary people who work in both private and public institutions have no say. That is a form of dictatorship. And, you know, I think, you know, if we, we talk about democracy, we have to extend it to all realms of, of life, including and very crucially, the economy. And the final issue I, I would flag up is, of course, the importance of free speech, uh, the right to say what you think and believe. Now, of course, that does not include the right to incite violence or to make false damaging allegations against someone or indeed to engage in harassment, intimidation, threats or menaces. But I think in our free and open society, we have to allow for the fact that people may say things that are offensive. You know, there's nothing in any human rights law which says you cannot cause offence, that causing offence is a crime. Um, you know, so, for example, when it comes to homophobic street preachers, you know, Christians who stand on street corners preaching against homosexuality, Obviously, I totally disagree with them. You know, I support protest against them, but I don't think they should be arrested and treated as criminals. You know, they have a right to their opinion and we have a right to challenge and change it. Um, you know, progress comes by challenging bigoted ideas, not by banning them. You know, we have to change people's hearts and minds to show why a bigoted opinion is wrong. Simply no platforming someone or banning them from speaking doesn't make their ideas go away. They just fester. Um, the best way to deal with bad ideas is with good ideas. Um, across all those different areas, it seems like if there's a thread, it's giving a voice to people who are voiceless, you know, in different contexts. Um, why has that been your life's mission purpose? Well, people often ask me what my motives are. And they're very simple and some I even say corny. You know, I love other people. You know, I love freedom, justice, equality. I want to see a world where all of us can have a free and equal place. Um, you know, I put my shoes in, my, put my feet in the shoes of others um, and think that if I was suffering an injustice, I would want someone to help me. So therefore, I have a moral, ethical duty to do what I can to help others, uh, to work with them, to amplify their voices, to empower them, to amp give expression to the fight they're undertaking. So, for example, Jeremy Bamba has been in prison for, for 36 years over the killing of five family members at White House Farm in 1985. Now, I don't know whether Jeremy Bamba is innocent or guilty. But looking into his case, I know he never got a fair trial. Masses of evidence was suppressed by the police, never given to the defense. 
at the time of his trial and indeed in his subsequent appeals against conviction. Now, I put myself in his position. If that was me, you know, I'd want someone to stand up and speak for me. Um, so that's why I do it. You know, I think you know, we overcome injustice by having allies and voices to support those who are getting a raw deal or who are victims of miscarriages of justice or discrimination. Solidarity is so, so, so important. You know, standing with others. You know, if we all stand with each other, we are together stronger and we can overcome injustices and inequalities. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.